Have you ever wondered what it would sound like if demons would write letters to each other? And what does that mean for how we should live our lives? That's what we'll talk about today. Neutral men are the devil's allies. Edwin Hubble Chapin. Today we're going to talk about the book, The Screwtape Letters, by C.S. Lewis. I read these books ages ago, probably about the year I became a Christian. And it struck me as a wonderful way to educate people on the way of our world. We think of how we go about things as being, first of all, new. Probably nothing is new. And secondly, that the devil isn't taking every opportunity to twist things around. We talked a little bit about when Paul saw organizational disasters happening or even logistic ones of travel, of prison. He saw the devil in that work, that it was easy to find that the devil was acting against us in certain ways. And when you talk about movies, too, there's the devil in a lot of different movies. And he's always bold and outlandish and someone we would immediately recognize as the devil. But the way that C.S. Lewis saw it, it was a lot more subtle than that. It's not about Linda Blair and the exorcist and making teenage girls' heads spin around backwards. It's about the subtle twinges of how do you just turn a human being around? Even see, like, let's say you wanted to convince someone of making a different decision in life, or maybe even making a different political decision in life. If you confront them and fight them and be bold against them, they might cling to what they know even more. You have to be a little bit more subtle about it. You have to have discussions about it. You have to bend people that way. And that's what the devil is really about here. He's not making this all out assault on humanity. He's tweaking. He's bending people just a little this way or just a little that way, or maybe even helping them go in a direction they're going already, which they see as faithful, but instead is putting you in a different direction and a direction that's away from God. That's why this book, The Screwtape Letters, is so ingenious about how it educates us to really what's going on. The important thing about this book is it's essentially a demon writing a younger demon, his nephew, letters about how to successfully get his human away from God. The human's not particularly religious and not really dedicated to God, so this seems like a pretty easy tactic to take on. Good thing to give to a brand new demon because this guy's not really that attached to worshiping God or being with God. And so these letters talk about advice that this older demon is giving the younger. It's a battle between good and evil. It is the demons trying to figure out how to get people away from what they call the enemy, which is God, and how we can be ripped away slowly but surely, even though we think we're doing the right things. I thought the book was interesting to read again. Again, I haven't read it for a really long time. But I also noticed that it also felt a lot older than I remember it being, but the message of it is still that important. So the first letter starts out, the demon that he's writing is called Wormwood. He calls him my dear Wormwood. And he's saying, I note that when you say about guiding your patient, that's the man, reading and taking care that he sees a good deal of his materialistic friend. We see that first step of how we're trying to get that human being away from God. And what materialism means, we think about calling someone materialistic about someone who only cares about money, but it's actually a bigger definition than you think. Only the physical matter is important. We're not spiritual beings. There is no spirit. We're just a bunch of what people say meat bags that are directed by chemicals, electrical impulses, maybe we're even just computer simulations. The only thing that matters is what the world around us is. And there's nothing else out there. The first step he has as getting his very not religious subject away from God entirely is just to show him this materialistic world. And you notice the first step is to introduce him to friends who are materialistic. We're going to see that 
notion of friendship come up a few times in this book. He says that you want to make sure that when we talk about God and we think about the things around us, he says that make sure that this man thinks of things in true versus false, or what he says, quote, academic or practical, or contemporary or outworn. These are all things that we hear right now, right? We hear, oh, well, the church is so old, or this is so outdated, or this is a post-Christian world. Now we're in modern times. We don't need gods. We don't need God. We don't need anything because now we're modern human beings. And it's interesting because I love history and I love reading about history. But even when you go back as far as the Bible, when you read it, the thing that really strikes you about it is the people are people. (laughs) They have jealousies, worries, fears. They cry over their children. They do horrible things to each other. People have always been people. And this concept that now we're modern people and we don't need God, we don't need religion, that's a way of talking about classifying things by categorizing things. God is so old and tired, but new is going out and living our wild existence with no concern for morality at all. Or maybe the morals we're concerned about are political morals. Maybe our new gods are politicians or political movements. The funny thing about it is I live in a place that has a very strong atheistic view on the world. But what's weird is you'll hear people talk about astrology talk about politics, talk about the earth or environmentalism as gods. It's not that we're not religious. It's not that we are no longer religious. We are still the religious people. Even if people don't believe it, we always were. It's just a new religion. There's a book, and it's pretty R-rated, so I'm not recommending it to you, called American Gods, and it is written by Neil Gaiman. The interesting thing about that book is it sets up this scenario that gods gain power by how many people worship this god, right? So this is not a religious book at all. But what's funny is all the gods kind of hang out and get along with each other. You know, Zeus and all the gods that exist all throughout the different parts of the planet, they for the most part leave each other alone. And because no one believes them in anymore, no one's following Odin or Zeus anymore, they don't have much power because they don't have that worshiper Uh, factor anymore. But now comes a new god, the American gods. And who are the new gods? One god is named none. And when we have these new gods, technology, media, Mr. World, who is about power and money and the things of this world, they suddenly don't have room for the other gods in this society anymore. And so they decide that they're going to kill all the other gods. You can see, in a sense, that that's what's really happening. It's not that we're losing our religiosity in America or the world. We're just gaining new worshiping targets. And they are unforgiving. They're cruel. There's no grace. There's no hope. And that's what C.S. Lewis is really getting at in here, is that when we pull this man away from God and make him think about materialism, Think of being more modern. Think of being more realistic. We're actually ripping him away from love, forgiveness, kindness, the concept that we are all exactly the same in God's eyes, that he loves every one of us no matter who we are. Maybe not loving all the actions we take, but we are loved. There is nothing except for God's love for us and what he calls us to do. Meanwhile, the new gods that people worship are cruel, unkind, unforgiving. And you'll notice that. You'll see that in our society today where people don't forgive each other. There's no room for love in their hearts. If you find someone you disagree with, you must destroy them. You can't let them just think things that are not what you think. And that is exactly what C.S. Lewis talks about. It's funny how this book was written at the beginning of World War II, nearly 80 years ago, and yet it's still the same thing, if not amazingly worse. So he says that we want to make sure that we don't get into arguing because we don't want to get them into a debate. 
We don't want this human thinking about this versus that. We just want him to think about those words. I'm a modern person. I'm a smart person. I'm an educated person. I don't believe in mythologies. And once you can get away from the actual debate about God, now you can go in and attack him. The other piece of advice is, if this man starts thinking about God and faith, then it's better to tell the man, you know, this is a very heavy subject. Why don't you go get lunch, take a nap, come back to it, and think about it a little later. So don't go directly into a debate about God. Do everything that you can to deflect the person. And he says that it's important, too, that you don't use real science against God and Christianity, because if you get into that debate about logic and facts and real investigation, it will lead to God. It won't lead him away from God. So it's important advice to get him away from the debate, get him, get him away from real science, and get him into jargon, modernity, humanism, realism, logical, I'm educated, and stay away from the debate. So at one point, the patient, the man, becomes a Christian. But he says, don't worry about that. We still have ways of getting him away from the church. And these are all going to be things like habits. When he is new to faith, he's not really used to it. He doesn't know what he's getting himself into. And so it's easy for him to get, first of all, overwhelmed with the jargon of the church. He may not know what it means. He may get there and see these old hymns being sung and he won't know them. He can believe that a lot of this has to do with religion instead of actual faith. And so it's easy to get him off track by just letting him join the church and seeing flaws in the church. He'll look at the people around him and he'll see young people and old people and rich people and poor people. And he'll see overweight people and odd ducks who wear interesting clothes. And that will make him think, wow, do I really belong here? I'm not like these people at all. I'm a modern guy. I dress pretty nice. I make a decent amount of money. And here are all these oddballs and I don't want to be a community with them. It's easy enough to split people away to think, this is not for me because look at all the people I'm with. There used to be an old joke that said I would never join a club that would have me as a member. That was an old Groucho Marx joke. But that's essentially the opposite of what we're doing. We're going to appeal to his arrogance that he's better than all these people at church. And it's easier than to tempt him away from that church and be judgmental about the people that he is communing with singing with, going to church with. I mean, it's funny because you see that where people will not want to belong to a church because X, Y, and Z belongs to a church, or it believes in this, that, and the other thing, or I would never join in a church that had people that look like that. It's arrogance. And what you have to realize is you're not perfect either. I can't sing. I can't carry a note whatsoever. And I remember once I was in church and I tried to sing hymns and do a little bit better. And little girl in front of me turns around and says, no singing. I mean, I get it. I'm not good at it. But you can see where you will think that the important thing is making sure the people around you are just like you, just as perfect and as wonderful as you are. So it's easy, he said. That's all you have to do is just make it so that the faith doesn't get into his head. But instead, make him think about the people he's communing with and how he's probably a lot better than they are or even just a lot different than they are. He'll see the old lady. He'll see the neighbor down the street he doesn't like, and that will make him get inside his own head instead of thinking about God and think about how God loves every one of us. He says, too, that it's easy to get him involved in some club situations. So we can consider whether you are likely to do more good by making him an extreme patriot or an ardent pacifist. Again, this is right at the beginning of World War II. And you know what? He says it doesn't really matter which direction you make him. By putting him into a slot, A or B, this versus that, left versus right, you know, whatever slots you get to put it in, suddenly now our morals are built on that. We're building up... Uh, an opinion about what it means to be A versus B. 
And suddenly that is the way that the devil can get inside and break those values. Because what if you found out that you picked A and that person sitting next to you at church is B? Ooh, don't want to talk about that. It's pretty weird and sad that people in my own church would believe differently than me. And so the way to divide a man from his church is to get him involved into group thinking. One of the interesting things that I saw a long time ago is there was a Nickelodeon television show called The Tomorrow People, and it was a science fiction show. But at one point, this alien life comes down to Earth, and they want to conquer Earth, right? So you've seen a lot of movies, science fiction movies, where people will try to conquer Earth. And what this group tried to do is all they did was assign half the people to green and half the people to blue. Colors didn't mean anything. Well, I'm green. I'm clearly better than blue. I'm blue. You're just all terrible because you're green. And all they had to do was assign people to these two colors. No one knew what it meant. It didn't even mean anything. And instantaneously, we started fighting green versus blue. It tore the planet apart. And the goal was to conquer Earth and destroy us as a being by green versus blue. And that's what this devil is talking about. He doesn't care what club you join. He doesn't care whether you're A or B or left or right or up or down. It doesn't matter. All he wants to do is put us into categories. And with those categories, he can destroy us from within. We talked a little bit about how the canon was trying to bring the Bible together to get rid of some of the heresies like materialism or Gnosticism and how even Paul in his writing said, some of you are following Apollo and other of you are doing this and doing that. Again, it is human nature to group up, but by doing that group and not seeing each and every one of us as a loved child of God, no better and no worse than we are, that's where we're going to start destroying each other And that's what this devil is really talking about. He doesn't care whether you're for World War II or against World War II, as long as you're fighting and as long as you are hating anyone who's different than you are. Boy, if you wanted to write up a description of the way our society is right now, I couldn't think of a better one. So my challenge to you is think about what types of factions do you have in your life? Do you pick left or right, A or B, up or down? What kind of group do you belong to? And does that group bring in these tiny cracks that cause you to fall out of love with your fellow parishioners, the person in the pew next to you or the person in the church down the street? And think deeply about whether or not those cracks in our brotherhood of man is causing division and how we and how we can stop those divisions from happening. But action happens. We stop division among us by stopping division with us, with the individual. I stop my own divisions. So think about your own divisions and what you can do to take those down so that we can be the children of God once again. All right, everyone, thanks so much. Please remember to contact me. I will pray for you. I will take any topics that you have in mind or any types of comments you have about the podcast. If you want to let me know what you think about the screw tape letters, I'd love to hear it. You can find my website at jill at smallstepswithgod.com. And with Twitter, I'm trying to reach out every day and bring good thoughts about what it is to be a Christian in the world today and what we can do to take our journey together. And remember that our walk away from the demons in our lives and how they're trying to tear us down starts with small steps.